Bell sits down with us, guitar in hand, and dozens of interviews packaged in his new book called Ain't Got No Cigarettes. In it, he delves into the dark and the lighter sides of American country legend Mr. Roger Miller, a man of unbelievable wit who was always funny and never lost for words. The sensational, slightly goofy country western genius songwriter Roger Miller made country music cool to the popular world. Miller is Lyle E. Stiles' hero. Style is one of Canada's country boys who sings, writes songs, and acts. He didn't know American music legend Roger Miller, but he knows him now. Lyle spent four years talking about his hero with some of the entertainment industry's biggest stars, Willie, Waylon, and the boys. The result is Ain't Got No Cigarettes. It is my pleasure to welcome Lyle E. Stiles to Studio 4 to tell us more. Hello. How you doing? Well, Roger Miller must have been long dead when you discovered him. It was in 1998, so I missed him by six years. But once I discovered him, things were never the same. How did you discover him? Um, well, I was living in Winnipeg and trying to pursue a career in music, tried Nashville thing, and couldn't move to Nashville without a university degree. So I came back to Canada and decided to give Vancouver a try to be an actor and a singer-songwriter, and I ended up being a waiter just down the street. <laughs> and uh, one night after a shift waiting tables, I turned on the TV and they had a special to Roger Miller. And uh, I started recognizing some of these songs, and I never even knew the, the name Roger Miller to associate that even to King of the Road. And uh, this special really just kind of drew me into the world of Roger Miller. And it was actually Lyle Lovett who uh, did a cover of My Uncle Used to Love Me But She Died. And I was like, my God, that's a country song? And <laughs> I got to get that. So the next day I ran out and picked up a Greatest Hits Written CD. by Roger Miller, My Uncle Used to Love Me But She Died. Exactly. His great song, song titles, <laughs> great song. All of them. I mean, really, uh, he once said, here's a song I wrote while I was singing that one. Well, he wrote hundreds of songs, and he, was, he would come up with a song like that, and uh, just the most original material I've ever heard from a country singer. In Nashville, uh, songwriters used to hang out with him just because he would talk in songs. The things that would come out of his mouth were just like great song titles or concepts for songs because he just saw the humor in things, and he saw things just from a different point of view altogether. How did you convince the Chris Christophersons, the Waylon Jennings, now... Uh, dead Waylon, but a yeah. great guy. Uh, Willie Nelson, Dwight Yoakam, Toby Keith. How did you convince them to talk to you? Well, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do it, and all you have to do is do it. You know, get, I, I really kind of thought from the end. That's a song. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you just kind of approach these guys or their people and say, I'm, I'm writing a book on Roger Miller, and uh, luckily no one's ever written a book on Roger Miller. I don't know if that's lucky for Roger, because he really deserves many books, because he was mm -hmm. such a genius. But for me, uh, these guys, they were like, absolutely, we'll talk to you about Roger, because no one's ever written a book on Roger Miller before. And uh, his stories needed to be told, and he was probably the most interesting guy in the history of entertainment. Did anybody uh, not say he was a genius in all of your interviews? Anybody say he was just a mediocre songwriter? No, it, he blew everybody away, and especially, he was a songwriter, songwriter. The songwriters in Nashville just absolutely thought the world of him, and his industry people thought the world of him, and uh, the people that worked in his band. Every night, Roger would put on a completely original show. Uh, a lot of these performers who have a lot of humor in their act, it'll be, they, it's very timed, you know, it's the same jokes if you see them this year, if you see them five years from now, it's a lot of the same humor and it makes it really boring for the band to be playing the same jokes and stuff like that. But with Roger Miller, he was so on all the time and uh, every show was just uh, completely hilarious and completely original and he did one show for the crowd watching and he also had inside jokes playing to the band so they really absolutely loved working with him. And sometimes he'd leave the stage there in the some. middle of the performance. <laughs> it's the side of Roger, like you know um, when I first started getting into Roger Miller all I knew about him, I had this uh, picture up on my wall of a, a old Greatest Hits album, and he looked like a banker or a car salesman. <laughs> and he, there was just something about him that kind of drew me into him, like wanting to know more. And, you know, there was a side that uh, just would never guess was a dark side to country music and, and, and to Roger Miller. At times, I guess he was getting really frustrated with his career, and he had uh, some addictions to pills. And he would get angry, because uh, at times he'd go to a show, and he'd have a whole show to do, and everyone's chanting, King of the Road, King of the Road. 
And he'll say, if you want King of the Road, I'll do it. And he sings it, and he says, that's how I close my show. And then he just walks off stage. <laughs> and or, says to his drummer or, or somebody, come with me, we're going for a drink. Yeah, well, let's go hit the casino, let's go swimming, <laughs> let's go back to the hotel. Just bizarre things. I've never even heard of, you know, the rock stars doing that. So uh, I think Roger Miller actually created the rock and roll lifestyle. You know, it's funny, as a kid, I used to just dread listening to country music on the radio. I wasn't into it at all. I just didn't get it. But it's kind of funny as an adult looking back and thinking that all these guys that my parents were listening to were drug addicts. And, you know, they were yelling at me for listening to Alice Cooper and stuff. Who <laughs> so it's kind of <laughs> strange that there was that whole dark side of country music. And the whole question of drugs is something that I never even brought up to any of the interviewees unless they brought it up first. But a lot of times they would bring it up. And they were really straightforward that um, it, it was just what was going on at the time. So, you know, Waylon Jennings actually told me that Roger Miller did more drugs than anybody, period. And I, I just thought that was really shocking because you look at him, he's a clean cut kind of mm -hmm. guy and it's the, you, you listen to King of the Road and the last thing you would expect is someone who, who really had a, a dark side to pills. Uh, uh, and when you say pills, speed, uppers, downers, lots, what? Lots of speed. That, lots of speed. But back then I think it was good for you. And it was also a sign of the times. These guys, they would be playing a show in Minneapolis mm -hmm. one night, and then they'd be booked the very next night somewhere in Texas. And the only way you can do that, they didn't have tour buses back then. They didn't have private jets. They just had their cars, and they actually had to get in the car, and they had to drive all the way. And the only way to do that, especially after a show, is by taking pills and stay up all night. You know, there's a little bit about it that's in uh, the Johnny Cash movie, Walk the Line. They kind of yeah. go into a little bit of, of the pill use. But a lot of these guys, th they really chat about that side of the industry. And uh, actually, Roger Miller threw parties celebrating that he quit, that he quit taking pills. And uh, he actually blamed quit taking pills on not having any more hit songs because he just wasn't writing the same because he was always up. He would stay up for weeks at a time. Could you? I, I have a hard enough time staying up till midnight now. Right. Never mind staying no, up No, I know he said something like that. I don't know if he wrote a song about it, but sleep. What the heck is that? Yeah. yeah. He was not a sleeper. No, not at all. Did he ever co-write with anybody? He co-wrote with a, with a few people, and uh, there was Bill Anderson that he co-wrote with in the 1950s with uh, Two Worlds Collide. Um, he wrote a couple of songs uh, with Curly Putman, and uh, he wrote, uh, probably his biggest co-writing hit was um, It Only Hurts Me When I Cry uh, with Dwight Yoakam. Oh, Dwight Yoakam. Yeah, yeah. So I love Dwight Yoakam. I, I think he was blown away, too, because he got to write with one of his heroes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he, and he knew that Roger did, didn't co-write. You know, a lot of songwriters would, would come up to Roger Miller in Nashville and say, uh, would you consider co-writing with me? And he, he'd ask them, did Picasso co-paint? Really? <laughs> so he'd say, he would say no. But I guess his, uh, Dean Miller was a big fan of Dwight Yoakam, and Dwight was a huge fan of Roger Miller. And so they got together and they wrote this great song. He also had a lot of adventures on the road and off, as you know so well. Uh, wh I, don't, I can't remember who he was with, when he chartered the helicopter to buy the Cadillac? He did, yeah. I guess what would happen, these guys, they would just get this thing in their heads that they want a new Cadillac, and they want it right now, and it's a Sunday, and so these guys, they would uh, <laughs> charter a helicopter, call up the Cadillac mm -hmm. company, and they would call the media, and Roger would have been up for two weeks at a time and just look, look crazy, um, and they'd go and buy this Cadillac. There's a Another story where Roger was in England and he brought a brand new car and he didn't realize what a pain it was to get it back to America, so he just left it there and <laughs> didn't give it well, to anyone. That's too much just tequila and too many pills, probably. Yeah. You know, in that in the drug-fueled haze, we yeah. can do anything. We're king, kings of the road, yeah. driving down the highway. Uh, I'd love to have a Cadillac. Well, why don't you buy one? Well, we're not near a Cadillac dealer. Well, yeah. let's rent a chopper. <laughs> okay, it makes a, yeah. a, a big part of us want to be there. It would be something else. Just you know. to observe. And uh, I think one of the more interesting things, uh, just from, from the adventure of writing the book and getting to hang out with your heroes, is you hear a lot of these guys talk about how they just blew all this money on, on vehicles mm -hmm. and cocaine and like immense amount of money. And then 20 years later, they don't have any hits or they lost their publishing on their songs. And all of a sudden, now they're living in a hotel where you see them pull up for the interview and they're driving the same Cadillac that they were driving back when they had their hits in the 70s. So it's kind of sad that I imagine that they ha must have a hard time sleeping just to know that they would buy a, you know, a, a pile full of cocaine and people would come into their place and just uh, right. snort it all up.